Good morning. If you'd like to open to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. Acts chapter 3 and verse 19. In Acts chapter 3, Peter is preaching a, a gospel sermon, one of his first ones that are recorded in the book of Acts. And, uh, and he's preaching to, to a group of people, and his, his message is about Jesus. His message is about Jesus, how Jesus performed miracles, how he performed uh, works of wonder and signs and, and these amazing things. But that the people he is speaking to, that they had taken Jesus and that they had crucified him. And so he tells them that they had crucified the Son of God, that they had crucified the Messiah, the person they had been so desperately waiting for. And, and then in Acts chapter 3, in verse 19, he gives them a, a command, a way to, to be saved from, from this sin, from their sins, and specifically the sin of killing Jesus. Acts 3.19, when he says, Repent, therefore, and be converted. And so he gives them two commands there, to repent and to be converted. And that phrase, be converted, it's used in a lot of different ways in today's society. People, people describe what it means to be converted in many different ways. In fact, some people would say that be converted shows that baptism is not really all that important. Because, you know, if, if baptism was important, surely Peter would have said that here. He would have said, repent and be baptized. And so I'd like us to kind of break down what Acts 3.19 says and to kind of answer that question, what does it mean to be converted? Acts 3.19, if we're looking at Acts 3.19, we can notice that really there are four parts to this sentence. There's two commands, and then there are two there are two uh, promises that come if you obey the commands. First, he says to repent. That's the first command. Second, he says be converted. That's the second command. And he says if you do that, if you repent and be converted, then third, your sins will be blotted out. The idea that they're going to be erased. They're going to be forgotten about. They're going to be uh, have the remission of sins. They'll be forgiven. And then he continues and says, so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And so we have these two commands followed by two promises. And then, to really understand what it means to be converted, we need to, to compare it to a very similar situation. In fact, if we go back just one chapter, one chapter to Acts chapter 2, we can see that there's really almost an identical situation happening here. In Acts chapter 3, have, we have Peter preaching go a gospel message. In Acts chapter 2, we have the same preacher, Peter. He is preaching a gospel message. He says very similar things. He talks about Jesus and the signs and the wonders and the miracles that he had performed. He talks about how these people had taken him, the Son of God, and how they had crucified him. They had crucified the Messiah that they were so desperately waiting for. And then he tells them, he tells them that he has a purpose. In verse 40, you notice he tells them the purpose of why he's preaching this message. He says, And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved. And so this is his intention, this is what he wants for them. In both Acts chapter 3 and Acts chapter 2, he wants for them to be saved. And then in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, he gives them a solution. This is what you do if you want to be saved from your sin of crucifying uh, the Messiah. This is what you do if you want to be saved from your sins. Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, he said, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so we see we have two very similar messages here. We have the same preacher preaching the same concepts, the same ideas, with the same goal in mind, and he gives them very similar uh, acts, uh, path of action that they can take in Acts 2.38 and Acts 3.19. Let's kind of break down Acts 2.38 in the same way we wrote down Acts 3.19 to kind of see the similarities that are here too. Acts 2.38, then Peter said to them, repent. So there's, there's four parts in Acts 2.38. Four parts, just like there's four parts in Acts 3.19. The first part in 2.38 is repent. The second one is to be baptized. So that, that sounds different, right? That's a different phrasing. You've got, you've got repent. Those are the same. But the second commands, be converted and be baptized, those are two different uh, wordings. And then he continues and says, for the remission of sins. And so our third part is identical. You have the blotting out of sins. And then you have the remission of sins, the same idea of your sins being forgiven. And then Acts 2.38, that you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so the second promise, it's, it's a little bit different. You've got times of refreshing that come from the Lord in Acts 
And then remiss, or, uh, receive the gift of the Holy Spirit in Acts uh, 2.38. What I want us to consider this morning is, as, as we look at this passage, we can consider that if everything else is the same, you know, you've got Peter in both places preaching the same message uh, about Jesus and his crucifixion and his resurrection from the dead, about, about uh, how to be saved. He gives them very similar uh, paths to, uh, to be saved. If all of those things are the same, then doesn't it, or the same, then doesn't it make sense then that just like repent, both of those are in the first place, and then remission of sins, blotting out of sins, those are in the same place? Wouldn't it make sense then that the gift of the Holy Spirit would really be the same thing as times of refreshing that come from the Lord? Those are both promises that are worded slightly different, but mean the same thing. And so likewise then, just as he tells them the second command, repent and be converted, wouldn't that really be the same thing as repent and be baptized? Isn't he just saying, repent and do what is required of you in order to be saved, repent and be baptized. And so this idea of being converted, it's the same idea as being baptized. You know, we talk like this all the time. You know, for example, let's say, just, uh, just as an example, imagine for a moment that I had come in this morning, and I was talking maybe to Spencer, and I was telling Spencer, you know, we, uh, when my wife and I came into town this morning, we drove past the church building, and we went down to the gas station, and we filled up our, our tank, and then we came back up to the church building. I think, I think Spencer, he seems like a, a reasonably intelligent person, I guess, you know? No, he, uh, Spencer would understand what I was talking about. Anyone would understand, and especially if you're familiar with Roy City, you're probably going to know exactly where I went, right? Then let's say later I'm talking to, to somebody else, and I, I say, you know, my wife and I, when we came to town this morning, we drove past the gas station, or we drove past the, the church building, and we went down to Bucky's, and we filled up, and then we came back uh, up to the church building. Well, see, I, I used two different phrases, but, but everyone knew exactly what I was talking about in both situations. You know, I used a generic phrase, the gas station, and I used a very specific phrase, Bucky's, and, and I was describing the exact same thing. We talked like that all the time. So in Acts 2.38, it was essential that he say, be baptized, because this is the very first time he's ever preached this message. This is the very first time he's ever taught them how to be saved. He had to say specifically, he had to use a specific phrase, be baptized. By the time that we get to Acts 3 and verse 19, Perhaps this is only the second time that he's taught it. Perhaps he's taught it several times in between. We don't know exactly how much time has passed, whether it's a couple of days, a couple of weeks, a couple of months. But, but we know that it, wasn't sh- it was shortly after and that he had already taught them. People, you know, 3,000 people were baptized on that first day. People were talking about this. More people had been baptized since then. People knew that baptism was closely associated with this idea of being saved into uh, the church that was established in Acts chapter 2, and so he doesn't have to use the specific phrase. He can say the gas station. He can say be converted, and people will know exactly what he's talking about. So Peter, Peter talked about baptism a lot. Look for a minute in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. In 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 21, Peter writes, 1 Peter 3.21, he says, There is also an antitype which now saves us. He says, There is something that now saves us. Baptism. He says, Baptism now saves us. And so, Peter lays it out there very plainly. Baptism is a part of what saves us. He says in Acts 2.38, Repent and be baptized so that you can be uh, have the remission of sins, so that you can be saved. Acts 3, 19, repent and be converted, be baptized. So he has tied in this idea of baptism over and over and over again. Peter taught that baptism is essential for salvation. And so it's, it's vital then for us to understand this concept of baptism. You know, today in our world, there's not a lot of agreement about baptism. People from, from all walks of life teach a lot of different things about the way to what we should be baptized, about the reasons why we should be baptized. And so it's vitally important that we understand exactly what the Bible teaches about baptism because Peter says salvation hinges upon it. You know, for example, we can consider Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. In Mark chapter 16 and verse 16, 
I, I've heard a lot of different teachings about Mark 16 and verse 16. In fact, I, I've heard of one scenario where, where someone asked someone to read Mark 16, 16, and without really looking at it, they clearly had, had memorized it. They read this, He who believes and is saved will be baptized. And if you look closely at it, and that's what they, it said, can you read that word for word for me, please? And, and so they, sure, I can read it word for word. And it said, he who believes and is saved, that's not what it says, right? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. There, there are so many people in the world today who, who don't understand this concept. And it's, it's an important thing for us to understand because it doesn't say he who believes and is saved. It says he who believes and is baptized will be saved. And so we understand that baptism is an essential thing for us to understand, both for our own salvation and also so that we can help other people to understand this. But, you know, the question is, really, why, why did God pick baptism? Of all the things that God could have asked to be done to us, of all the things that God could have uh, required of us, why is it baptism that he chose? Well, we could say, first of all, we could say we do it just because he said so. You know, it's like we want to be saved. God says baptism is the way to do it. And so we just say, yes, sir, and we just get in the water and we do it because, because that's what God says. But God is a very gracious God. God doesn't just, uh, he, he actually gives us the reason why baptism was chosen. And so uh, I want to look at that. He gives us the reason why he chose baptism. And he also tells us all of the benefits that we get from baptism. You know, baptism, it saves our soul, but it does so many other things for us too. Consider Ephesians chapter 1. And verse 3. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3. As we try to answer this question of why God chose baptism and what the benefits are from it, in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. And so he says, we can have every spiritual blessing. I think this is a really neat concept. You think about God as our father. It's like fathers, I'm a father. I try to be good to my children. I try to do good things for them, but I can't give them everything that they need. I can't give them everything that I even want to give them. But God, as our father, says that he gives us every spiritual blessing. He's able to give us everything that he wants to give us, everything that we need. There is not a spiritual blessing that God does not give us if, he says, we are in Christ. That's the end of verse 3. We are in Christ. And so, just briefly, we can consider what some of those are. In verse 7, he says that in him, in Christ, is found redemption and forgiveness. In verse 11, he says we have an inheritance in him, in Christ. You know, that, that's a really neat concept, right? I don't know about most of you. I'm not really expecting to get an inheritance that when I'm older or anything like that, you know. And, and some people you hear about, they get these great fortunes, right? And it's like their life is kind of set for them. I'm not really expecting that. And so, but, but God says that in the next life, we get an inheritance. We get this inheritance from our Heavenly Father. Such a, such a, neat, a great promise that he has given us. And that's found in Christ. In verse 13, he says that we have trust, that we are able to have peace in our souls because of the trust that he gives us in him, in Christ. Verses, chapter 2 and verse 6, that we are raised up together. If we want to be raised up, we have to be in Christ. Chapter 2 and verse 7, that we have grace and kindness in Christ. Chapter 2 and verse 13, that we are brought near to God when we are in Christ. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 18, we have access to the Father. We're able to come before the Father's throne in Christ. Chapter 3 and verse 12, we had boldness and access with confidence in Christ. Notice Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. Romans chapter 8 and verse 1. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and he says, There is therefore, there is therefore now no condemnation. There is no condemnation. And you think about that, that we've all sinned, that we've, we've all made mistakes, that we are all deserve punishment. But he says that there is, there is no punishment. There is absolutely no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And so we very much want to be in Christ because that's where, that's where no condemnation is found. That's where every single spiritual blessing is found. But notice then that if you are outside of Christ, you don't have any of these things. 
Look back at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12. In Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, he says, Paul says that at that time you were without Christ. You were outside of Christ. You did not have Christ. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope. It's absolutely zero, no hope, and without God in the world. And so he says, really, he's talking about two different kinds of people here. He says, there are some people, and they have no hope. They are without God. They are outside of Christ. He says, there are some people, and they have every spiritual blessing. They don't just have hope. They have everything that God wants to give them, and they are found in Christ. And so the question then is, how do you get in Christ? He tells us that in Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27, Paul tells us, he lays it out very plainly, exactly how to get in Christ. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 27. In Galatians 3.27 he says, For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. The most important word, the most important word in that sentence, it's not baptism, that's a very important word, the most important word in that sentence is the word into You know, we have those who are outside of Christ, and we have those who are in Christ, but but there has to be some into process, right? It's like if I'm in this room and I want to go into that room, I have to go through the door, right? If I'm outside and I want to get into my car, right, I have to go through the door so that I can be in my car. And so he says, if you are outside of Christ and you want to be into Christ, verse 27, you are baptized into Christ. And so baptism is how we get into Christ. Baptism is is that essential element that now saves us, as Peter says, for the remission of sins, Acts 2.38. But still, still, that doesn't really answer the question, why did God pick baptism? Of all the things that he could have picked, uh, God picked baptism. Why why is that? Well, Paul begins to answer this in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. Paul begins to answer the question of why God picked baptism in particular. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1, he says, Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel. This is, this is going to be the key phrase for the next few minutes, this idea of the gospel. He says, I declare to you the gospel, which I preached to you. So he says, you know, I, I preached this to you. I taught you what the gospel was. And he said, which, you, uh, which also you received. And so he preached it and, and they accepted it. They understood it. And he says even that they stand in it, that they fully embrace this idea of the gospel. Verse 2, by which also you are saved. Here he says the gospel is directly related to our salvation. If you hold fast that word which I preached to you, the word that he preached to them was the gospel, unless you believed in vain. Verse 3, for I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received. Now what did he deliver to them? The gospel. And it says that he received the gospel from God, and then he delivered it to them. And then verse 3, there's that colon there. That colon. That colon tells us he's finally going to tell us what he said he'd declare in verse 1. I declare to you the gospel. The colon, now he's going to declare it. The gospel is that Christ died for our sins. Number 1, Christ died, according to the scriptures. Number 2, that he was buried in verse 4. And then number 3, that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. And so, so Paul says the gospel is, in essence, the death of and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's a list of events that happened almost 2,000 years ago. It's a list of historical uh, things that took place in the life of Jesus. And Paul says that it is a serious piece of information. Paul says that, that we need to heed this gospel with excruciating detail. Look, for example, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 6. 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6, Paul writes, It is a righteous thing with God. God considered it a good thing to repay with tribulation those who trouble you, and to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. So he says, first of all, 
There is a rest that is coming. That's a part of that every spiritual blessing, right? The rest that we have coming. We can look forward to this. Sometimes life is hard. Sometimes life is challenging. But we know that if we can make it to the end, there is a rest that we are looking forward to. And he says that rest comes when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. And so it's talking about the second coming. It's talking about when Jesus returns and puts an end to the world and takes us home so that we can rest with him. Oh, what a blessing to look forward to. He talks about that first group of people. But then in verse 8, he talks about a second group of people. He says that the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire. And what a contrast. It doesn't get more contrasted than that. You have rest on the one hand, and you have flaming fire on the other hand. This is not the, the nice fire that's in your fireplace when things get cold outside, right? This is a flaming fire. This is a, 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 a vengeful, vengeful fire, he says. And flaming fire taking vengeance on two, two kinds of people. Really, really one kind of person with two qualities. Those who do not know God and those who do not obey the gospel. The gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now what was the gospel? It was the death and burial and resurrection. He says, if you don't want God to take vengeance on your soul, to punish you for your separation, for your sin that you have committed, then you need to obey the gospel. You need to obey the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But, you know, to some people, this can seem kind of confusing. How, how do you do that? How do you obey a list of events that happened almost 2,000 years ago? How do you obey the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ? A description of what Jesus did. Well, Paul explains this in Romans chapter uh, 6 and verse 17. Romans chapter 6 and verse 17. Romans chapter 6 and verse 17, Paul writing about the gospel, he says, But God be thanked, praise God, thank God, that though you were slaves of sin, though you were separated from God, though, though your sins had uh, removed you and, and prepared you for punishment, verse 17, yet you obeyed. We're going to notice some kind of similar phrases in here. Remember 2 Thessalonians, he says, obeyed the gospel. Or here he says, again, obeyed from the heart. Remember, in 2 Thessalonians, there were those uh, vengeful, uh, flaming fire and vengeance because they did not believe in God. So here he says they obeyed from the heart. They truly believed. They obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. What doctrine had Paul delivered to them? Remember 1 Corinthians 15? He delivered, he said, the gospel to them. He preached the gospel to them. They had received it. They were standing in it. He delivered the gospel. And he says that they obeyed the gospel, just like he talked about in 2 Thessalonians, that those who obeyed the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The key word here in verse 17 is the word form. That word form, or, or some translations might say pattern. You know, and it's almost like Paul is saying, well, in order to obey the gospel, you need to be crucified on a cross, buried in the ground, and then raised from the dead. That's, that's almost what it sounds like Paul is saying. But, but it's not what Paul is saying, and we know that doesn't really make sense, right? How, how are we going to be crucified and then buried and then raised from the dead? But he says we need to do something like that, something in the form of the gospel, something in the pattern of the gospel, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And Paul explains what that form is. Uh, just back a few verses in Romans chapter 6 and verse 5. This is in the context of verse 17. It's the, it's the same conversation that he's having back in Romans chapter 6 and verse 5. He says, For if we have been united together in the likeness, in the pattern, in the form of his death, remember, what is the gospel? It's the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. If we have been united in the likeness of his death, certainly also we shall be united in the likeness of his resurrection. Right? That's the goal that we all want to get to, the rest that he promised us when Jesus returned, the, the comfort that we are going to receive at that time, the resurrection. He says, if we are united in his death, then we will be united in his resurrection, in that form of the gospel. So how do we do that? Well, verse 3 makes it very plain. In verse 3 he says, Or do you not know, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death. Remember this idea of being in Jesus. This is where every spiritual blessing is found. 
This is where everything that God wants to give us is found in Jesus. And he says that we can be baptized into Jesus. Like we looked at in Galatians, baptism takes us into Jesus. That's how we get there. Baptism now saves us. If we want to be in Jesus, then we'll be baptized. But he also says in verse 3 that when we are baptized, that's also the time that we are baptized into his death. And you think about it. When you step into that water to be baptized, when you, when you take a step into it, you are separated from God because of your sin. That's what he says in verse 6. Look down in verse 6. He says, Knowing this, that our old man, our sinful self, was crucified with him, that the body of sin, that, that corpse that had committed sin, might be done away with. So he says, you step into the water, and that corpse of sin, that old man, when you step into the water, you are crucifying him, just like Christ was crucified on the cross. Then he continues in verse 4 and says, Therefore, we were buried with him. And so someone who's crucified, what do you do with them? Well, well, if you're like Jesus, you bury them. And so you step into the water, you crucify that old man, and then you bury him under the water, just like Jesus was buried into a grave. And it says in verse 4, we are buried with him through baptism. Baptism is the form of burial into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. Newness of life is the idea that after you were buried, you are raised from the dead, and you have a new life. You're not that corpse of sin anymore. You're a new creature, a new creation, cleansed, purified of your sins, and ready to live a life for God. Verse 5, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly also we shall be united in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. So he tells us, baptism is essential. Baptism is required if we are going to have the rest that Jesus brings us, because it is the way that we obey the gospel, the way we obey the death, burial, and resurrection. Remember 2 Thessalonians? He came in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who did not obey the gospel. So if we want to obey the gospel... God says, be baptized. Why does he require baptism for salvation? Because it is the way that we conform to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's the way that we honor what he did for us. How we recognize that just as he did it, we do that to our sinful selves so that we can live this new life. It's the way to be in obedience to God. Sometimes, though, sometimes I'm afraid that we stop there. You know, we tell people, we tell people, like Acts 2.38 says, that we are baptized for the remission of sins. That's important. People need to know that. A person who doesn't recognize that they're lost, baptism's not going to do anything for them. You can't baptize people just to, just to be sure about something. We baptize them because they are lost, for the remission of sins. That's important. We tell people baptism is for salvation. That's true. It is. That is important. People need to know that when they are baptized, that is the moment that they are saved. But still sometimes, even with those elements, we can baptize people and still be missing a key piece of information. They can still be baptized for the remission of sins and come out of the water lost because there's one more important thing that we have to know at baptism. And Paul starts explaining this in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 5. In Ephesians 4 and verse 5, Paul is writing... And he says that there is one Lord, one authority, one head that we submit to. There's one faith, one way that we obey God through the same message, and one baptism. Now sometimes people read this and they say, oh, that means you can only be baptized one time. Well, in a sense, that's true, because if your first baptism isn't valid, then this first, the, one that you, the second one that you do is actually the only one that you've done. But what he's really saying is there's one correct way to be baptized. There's one method of baptism that is accurate. There's one, uh, you know, sprinkling, pouring, any of those things. Those are not the correct way to be baptized. And so, so there's only one correct form. And also there's only one correct reason. So if we're not baptized for the right reason, then it's not the correct baptism. So he says there is one baptism. And if you weren't really baptized at that time, then you just got wet. Ephesians, uh, or Acts chapter 19 uh, shows us a really great example of this. The, the Ephesians in Acts chapter 19, they were really with this. They were really familiar with this idea of one baptism because they had faced this exact exact situation in Acts chapter 19. 
Acts chapter 19 and verse 2, Paul is coming to Ephesus for the first time to preach a gospel message, and he was pleased to find that there were already believers there. He was excited about this. And so he comes to them in verse 2 of Acts chapter 19, Acts chapter 19 and verse 2, and he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And this is an important question that he's asking them, and he's expecting a certain answer, but he didn't get the answer he was expecting. Notice verse 2, so they said to him, we have not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. Now this, this set off alarm bells in Paul's head. Something, something he said is not right here, because Matthew chapter 28 and verse 19 teaches us that we are baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. How can you be baptized into the Holy Spirit, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and not, and not know who the Holy Spirit is? And so he says something, something is missing here. They're, they're lacking some important piece of information. So verse 3, he said to them, into what then were you baptized? That's that's really the question that he needs to know, because they should have been baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so, if they weren't baptized in that name, then what name? And they said, into John's baptism. Oh, okay, well, this, this makes sense to Paul then. He, he understands what happened. It's really really pretty a sim- pretty simple scenario. You've got John the Baptist, and before Jesus came, John the Baptist went around preaching baptism, and many people were baptized into John's baptism. But, but John's baptism just pointed forward. It pointed ahead to Jesus' baptism. And that's what he says in verse 4. He says, Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with a baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. So he says, I'm pointing you ahead. I am baptizing you into John's baptism, but I'm pointing you ahead to a better baptism. Uh, verse 4, Should believe on him who came after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And so Paul says, you know, so you should have, uh, you were baptized into John's baptism, and you know what, that will just be fine. We'll just leave it at that, right? No, he says in verse 5, when they heard this, when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They recognized that their first baptism, while it was valid at the time, originally, it wasn't valid anymore. They, they'd been baptized once, but they needed to have been baptized a second time in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins to be saved. But the key point here, the key point that I want us to notice, is that John's baptism was for the remission of sins. Look in Luke chapter 3 and verse 3. Luke chapter 3 and verse 3. In Luke chapter 3 and verse 3, Luke is writing about John the Baptist. And he says that John went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. So he says, John baptized for the remission of sins. The people who have been baptized by John, they've been baptized for the remission of sins. And so these people uh, in the book of, of Acts, the Ephesians, they had already been baptized for the remission of sins, and yet they were not saved despite that. And so the point is that there is a way that you can be baptized for the remission of sins, and still not be saved. Now, now, no one today, no one today is baptized into John's baptism. At least I've, I've never heard of anyone being baptized into John's baptism. And still, there is, there is one way today that a person can be baptized into Christ in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the remission of sins and still not be saved because they're missing one key piece of information. Just as the Ephesians were missing a crucial step, so can we sometimes. So I, I think it's very important. It's very important that we look at what that key piece of information is, and it's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 13, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized. Notice, first of all, he says, Everybody was baptized. Everyone. Anyone who was a part of the church, anyone who was a part of the saved group of people that he was writing to, they were all baptized. And he says that they were all baptized into the same thing, into one body. You know, I'm afraid what happens sometimes is that we teach people baptism for the remission of sins. People in the world, they might teach people baptism for the remission of sins, but they don't teach them what that body is. But if you don't know what the body is, how can you be baptized into the body? Just like the people in in Acts 19, they didn't know what the Holy Spirit is. If you don't know what the Holy Spirit is, how can you be baptized into the Holy Spirit? That's what uh, Paul said, right? 
And so if that's the case, then the same thing is true. If people don't know what the body is, how can they be baptized into the body? Now, what exactly does that mean? Look in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 4, Paul says, There is one body. You know, it's, it's like you imagine. If you're walking down the street, if I was walking down the street with my three-year-old daughter, and we saw someone walking toward us, and they had one head, but they had maybe two or three torsos and legs attached to that one head, my, my daughter might panic, right? Like, that would look like a monster. That's what she would say. That's a monstrosity, right? And you, you probably think, well, no one would say that. My three-year-old daughter has crazy words that she says. So she might say monstrosity, I don't know. But, uh, but, you know, if you see that, if you see one body or several bodies attached to one head, you would recognize that's not natural. That's not the way we were intended to be. Paul says the same thing, same thing here. He says there is only one body, one spirit. That's the idea of one message. We are all speaking the same thing. Uh, one hope, they all do that. We're looking to the same place. We're all putting our trust in the same person. That person is the one Lord, the, uh, the head of the, of the body, Jesus. He says, one faith that we all obey together that one message. One baptism, we were all saved in the same way. One God and Father of all, we all worship and, and serve the one creator who made us. And so he says, there is only one body. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, he tells us just exactly what the body is. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, he says that, that God put all things under Jesus' feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church. And so here we have this head again, right? A head attached to one body. He says he's the head of the church. He's the authority over the church. Whatever Jesus says in the church, that's what goes. Verse 23, which is his body. So he says there is one body. And then in verse 22 and 23, he says that the body is the church. And so he says, there is one church. You know, how, how could there be more than one church? How, how can one church teach one thing about salvation, and another church think, teach a completely different thing about salvation, and both of them be right? Both of them be going to the same place. Both of them be working together. He says there is one church, one body, with one head on it. And if we saw a person with two bodies, we would say, that is a monstrosity. And when we try to say that there's, there's one head but multiple bodies, multiple churches, God says that is a monstrosity. That is not what he intended. And so he says there is one body. And I want us to, to really notice 1 Corinthians 12, 13. He says, for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. There is only one church. And if we were baptized before, if we were baptized before, and we were baptized into a different church, even if it was for the remission of sins, even if it was for salvation, even if it was into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, if it was into a different church, it says that that baptism is not valid because it didn't put you into the one body. How can you be baptized into a body that you've never heard of yet? And so when we find that one true church, then we must be baptized for all of those reasons, for the remission of sins, by the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, for salvation into the body, the church that God established in Acts chapter 2, the church that he has given us here today that we can be a part of. And instead of having that flaming, the flaming vengeance of fire, the, the, those who did not obey God, did not obey the gospel, we can have every spiritual blessing. We can have everything that God wants us to give us, but it's only if we've obeyed that gospel, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. So if you're here this morning, and you, you have not done that, this is, this is the time. This is the time to do that. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. We don't know how long that we might have, but we know that God wants us to be saved. And, and we know that he will save us if we will submit ourselves to his will and do what he has asked us to do. So we ask that you come forward now as we stand and sing.